Hello everybody, Jack Pittman here, and this is my course all about the lies that used to ruin my life. I have the luxury of free time all day, almost every day, I just work an hour or two, and I've been living this way for four or five years, and at this point I have learned a lot about free time and the mind. Everything in the course is free, as usual, but if you want to talk with me directly, you can consult with me for a wide variety of things. You can do this at any point by going to calendly.com slash Jack Dermot Pittman or by going to the top link in the description of this video. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is that I used to think my career was kind of more important than my relationships. And I don't know where that came from, but I just in general felt that it was acceptable to work a lot and put my friends off because I was working. I thought that that was the thing I was supposed to do. I thought that, that was what the responsible thing to do was, to focus on your career and not get distracted, so to speak, by friendships and romantic relationships, you know, you know? But it's a very miserable way to live. And your time here on this earth is very short. Your life, how you feel, will be defined by your friends and your lover. These are the people who will determine your state of mind. If you are judged by these people who are close to you, it doesn't matter how much you achieve. Oh, the monkey came into the tree. I recently made these stingless beehive things, and uh, I was trying to get stingless bees to mess with them, but this monkey is really messing with my shit right now. Hello, monkey. That's unusual. Well, it doesn't matter how much you achieve, because you are the environment that you are in. And your relationships with friends and family are what determine your success and happiness in life. Job is just the thing we blindly follow, and the friendships and relationships that crop up on the way are what sustain us. Another belief I used to have is that I was going to be happier uh, simply if I just earned some more money. And this is partially true, you know? Um, what is that monkey doing? In some ways this is true. There are ways you can suffer less, but it seems to be that Money doesn't correlate to happiness and fulfillment, and in fact, can actually make it harder for you to enjoy happiness and fulfillment. Um, those without money have this mentality where we, or they, or whatever, feel that if just they had enough money, things wouldn't be so hard, things would be easier. And don't get me wrong, in extreme cases this definitely is true, and you can't, literally can't get medical help because you can't afford it. Uh, you, you would be better off with some more money. Yeah, definitely. But you would be surprised when it comes to happiness and fulfillment how little money actually does to enable you to build that life, and if anything, how easy it is for money to become an obstacle that creates habits that actively get in the way of you living your truest life to your highest purpose. Because the more money you're flowing through you, the more of a, a target, so to speak, you are for other people who will try and make money with you, uh, off of you. Now, I'm not even talking about people who are going to abuse you. I mean, people who want to get involved and make money with you and push you up and get hyped, right? There is a lot of 
problems that all humans have to deal with growing up. We come into a very complex time where it really does take about 30 years of being alive and being exposed to things and understanding the complexities of the world and learning and studying. What you'll find is that money makes more. So if you don't address your problems, you getting more money will actually grow your problems bigger to the point where you are confronted with them in such an intense way that you have no choice but to deal with your problem or be consumed by it. And there are many people who bring a whole flood of money into their life, get consumed and lost in it, and ultimately lose it all. That's past, it's something in the past, and they always live in a shadow of those events. And that too is a shitty way to live. Don't focus on the money and don't trick yourself into thinking that if you just had enough money, you wouldn't have the problems that you do. Because that's not... The next lie is that I should work hard. Yeah, like, I want to be a person who works harder than other people. Yeah, that's what I used to think. I used to build a lot of my value out of my ability to work. I remember thinking, wow, my friends can't really know me because they can't see what I'm like at work. They can't see what I'm really like. That's the way I used to live. But what does working hard do for you? Nothing. All that working hard does is pit you in a competition with millions of other people around the world who are being abused and working their asses off and getting little next to no compensation. We live in a world where most of the people who do the work get the least amount of pay. And why is it that my generation is less well off than our parents? Why is it that very few of us are going to be able to afford housing? Why is it that retirement is in question and up in the arms? How can all these things be true at the same time? You know? Working hard is a waste of your life. Don't work hard. Unless it's for something you care about, someone you care about. Don't let yourself just be taken advantage of for what? So that you can retire when you're 60? Live a lavish life, take vacations, never really have the time to spend with the people you meet, the children you raise? What kind of life is that? Don't focus on working hard. Focus on working smart. What can you do in 30 minutes a day that will change your future? What habit can you develop that will hurt you less than the habit you have that is hurting you already? These are the changes that truly bring amazing things into our life. Do not focus on working hard. Because there is always someone who will work harder than you. You should focus on working smart. Figuring out how to get as much done, so to speak, in as little time as possible. Doing nothing? What do you do? Just sit around all day doing nothing? You just spend the whole week doing nothing? I was gone all the time and you've just been around doing nothing, doing nothing, doing nothing. We've been encoded, we've been taught. Doing nothing is bad. Why is that? First, we must understand that when we say doing nothing is bad, we're not literally saying that. We don't mean it's bad to do nothing. We're saying that there are things that are so pointless to do that they are the same as doing nothing, right? Imagine, you know, binging Netflix for hours and hours and hours when you have some report to work on or, you know, staring at your phone instead of spending time with your kid or, you know, your mother or father, right? This kind of thing. So, we're taught that it, it's bad to do nothing, but, and yet when we say doing nothing, we're actually not doing nothing. We, we never do nothing. 
we're always doing something, you know? We're always doing something. And this is really bad for us. And believe it or not, especially if you're an, an individual who needs to figure things out for whatever reason, there's stuff you got to do, you got to accomplish, you got to provide for your family, someone's sick, whatever. You need to do nothing. And your inability to figure out how to fix your, your problem comes from the fact that you fail to do nothing. We must spend more time in a state where we are just there doing nothing, not stimulating, simply feeling what we feel and being there. This is incredibly important for your well-being, and you will suffer if you do not do this. If you do not take the time every day, every couple hours, to do nothing, you will suffer. Free time. Oh, free time is amazing. But I only know that now, after what I've been through, and losing my father, and wasting parts of my life. It's so tragic, how we talk about it, as if free time's bad. You know, free time is the devil's playground. Ask yourself, do you, do you really think that way? Because that means that you, you mistrust yourself so deeply, that you think that if you have time, to live your life, you will abuse it. Think about how silly that is. Free time isn't some distraction. Free time isn't something that gets in the way. It's not a bad thing. It is the playground of imagination. It is what creates people who can invent solutions to problems, have a lot of free time. Having free time is hugely important to developing into your truest self. Being able to enjoy your life is dependent on your ability to maintain free time for you to spend doing what you love. And I understand you may say, look, if I, if I have free time, I have all the free time, I don't have motivate, whatever. Free time is a resource, just like motivation is a resource. If you have free time, but you're not using it well, that means something is missing in your life. You aren't motivated enough because you don't have something in your life. Not a material thing, a part of your life, a component of your environment. Someone to take care of, an animal to take care of, plants to take care of. Something that makes you take better care. There are things that will influence you into what you want. It's just a matter of placing them in your environment and going through the cycles that you're going to go through. Binging on Netflix is a horrible use of your free time. When you work a full-time job and don't have the time to do anything to change that, and you spend it on Netflix, that doesn't lead anywhere. But when you have a lot of free time and you binge on Netflix, you know what happens? You, you get bored of it. You don't want to because you have enough time that you can do that. Free time is so important for you to go through the things that you need to go through so that you can stop getting in the way of yourself. Free time should be worshipped. And if you focus on anything in this life, let it be establishing free time for yourself and those that you love. Next lies are all about eating. Uh, food plays a huge role in the psyche and the experience of any consciousness. Whether you're an animal, or like us, we're animals, or theoretically anything else. Consciousness exists to procure food reliably. So our relationship with food is hugely important. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, food kills us. The act of eating, believe it or not, is inherently unhealthy. 
I'm not talking about chemicals, I'm not talking about bad things for you or sugar or anything. I'm talking about the act of eating itself. Imagine that your body is taking in something that does nothing, it's neutral, it doesn't harm anything, it's just neutral. This process of taking in and ripping it apart and chemically changing things, it's very exhausting for your body, it's very inflammation inducing for your body. Eating itself is a harmful act. It's very important that you understand this because we take eating for granted and we treat it as if we, we know it's healthy, we know we need to do it, and we do it in an abundance, but it actually causes us harm. So the key to eating healthily is to eat foods that are so dense in nutrition and energy that you don't need to eat very much. Now, the next lie is actually one of my personal favorite lies, because this one is really fun. <laughs> and it's that, uh, well, fat. You know that stuff that's supposed to be really bad for you? You know, low-fat diets, everything in the supermarket is covered in low-fat, no-fat, avoid fat. Apparently, that's actually just bullshit. Fat is actually the healthiest substance you can consume when done in moderation. Because, as I mentioned earlier, eating itself is a dangerous process for your body. You want to eat by weight an absolute minimum for what you need. Fat enables you to do that. And what's very interesting about fat is that if you try to overconsume fat without carbohydrate, you just can't. You can eat fat until you get full and you won't eat too much. You won't gain weight. We gain weight and we are fat because of carbohydrate, not from fat. And we think fat is bad because our generation was lied to. Really, we were lied to. Fat is not bad. Fat is actually remarkably healthy for you. And if you eat high fat foods that are not oxidized, you can eat less food and eat less carbohydrate. What you'll often find is that the problems you have with diet and eating and weight are blamed on everything except what they actually are from, which isn't fat, it's carb. We blame fat when fat is the answer. Now, you must understand oxidization because when fat gets oxidized, you can imagine it as when it gets, it decays, it grows old, it becomes burned by the air, right? This, when it goes rancid, that makes it bad for you. So when you consume fat that is oxidized, it becomes poisonous for you, okay? Oxidized fats are heated. Anything that's heated, oxidizes. There is no oil that is treated with heat that results in a healthy product. It's all a lie. If you are consuming oil, vegetable oil, you are told it will reduce your chance of heart disease. It will create heart disease. It is a highly, highly oxidized product, a waste product that we put in everything that is poisoning all of us. Fat is good, but natural fat, not these oils, not vegetable oils, things like butter, coconut butter, or coconut oil, whatever you want to call it. Understand oxidization and understand that the more oxidized something is, the more bad it is for you. So you really want to be consuming fats that are as unoxidized as possible. Those are the healthy substances, okay? Oh, oh, wait, wait, no, you're not eating your breakfast. What are you doing? What kind of life do you have if you don't force yourself to eat food in the morning when you don't want it? 
Obviously, you should be eating lots of sugary cereal and all sorts of other stuff, or at the very mi minimum, a healthy breakfast. You know, I used to think that. And obviously, because this is in the video, you know, it's not true. Breakfast, as we know it today, is totally unnecessary and was entirely created to get us to eat more so that people who create food can earn more money. But that is it. You don't need to force yourself to eat in the morning. Breakfast is not the most important meal of the day, and most humans naturally do not find themselves hungry in the beginning parts of the day, okay? You eating in the beginning of the day tells your body that you're going to eat more food. So yes, it's true that from the perspective of how do we get humans on this planet to eat as much as possible, yes, breakfast is really important because they need to eat the breakfast to get their appetites kick-started so they just keep consuming. That's true. But you don't need that. You can eat when you're hungry and you can eat foods that satisfy you, you enjoy, and make you feel full. Breakfast. Oh, wait. Bacteria. Run! <laughs> Obviously, some bacteria can be very harmful. But the problem with the West, in general, is we imagine life in a Petri dish. We imagine wiping a scene of all bacteria, getting rid of everything. And then, of course, well, life comes back. And then we're like, oh, shit, and then we wipe everything again. And then life gets back, and we're like, fuck, and then we wipe everything again. And obviously, the moment we stop wiping everything, well, yeah, we don't, it, it all comes back. The bacteria is everywhere, right? And this is the fundamental problem. Bacteria is part of us. We are bacteria. We are consumed by, aided by, and helped by bacteria in many, many ways. The bacteria all around us are not only just beneficial, but they are fundamentally part of our lives. And when we are surrounded, not just consuming, but surrounded by ecosystems with a lot of biodiversity and healthy bacteria competing, there's no space for something invasive. There's no space for a killer, vicious, dangerous, bad bacteria to infect you. Because all the space is taken up by a multitude of different forms of beneficial bacteria. As a society, we fail to understand bacteria on a minor level and on a macro level. Bacteria are a fundamental part of our own immune systems that extend past us and go into us. And you must understand that the defense in the bacterial world is a full, already existing, thriving bacterial population that's aligned towards your best interests. If you keep wiping everything away like the West does, like we do, if you just keep wiping and trying again and wiping, you're just gonna stay sick. You need to create the circumstance that creates that thriving bacterial balance, that flora of good, healthy bacteria all around you. And when you're disinfecting crap, whether you realize it or not, you're actually making yourself more sick in the future. And that is the opposite of what you're trying to do. Bacteria are beautiful. We've also really normalized sitting in a chair, like, you know, like, like this kind of thing. I mean, I, imagine using a computer in this kind of chair. I mean, y you obviously don't like that, right? You want a proper chair, a comfortable chair, because chairs are natural, right? We're using a computer all the time sitting, but do you know that's killing us? Sitting in a chair is a violent act for your body. We, our bodies are not made to sit that way, okay? And you can understand this if you study any kind of Buddhism or any kind of meditation and you get really deep into it, you actually have to learn a lot about posture and all this crap 
to even be able to spend time sitting still for long periods of time without your body decaying. And it's quite ironic, actually, that in the computing world, we're suffering a lot because we're still sitting in chairs, right? You have two options. Stop sitting in a chair and stand, or start learning cross-legged, okay? The problem with sitting is it fucks up your back and your shoulders, and it makes you hunch. But when you sit in a cross-legged sort of yoga position, it redistributes the strain in your body and straightens your back just naturally by how you're sitting. So this is the position you should be sitting in, on a minimal chair that just has a cushion and as little space as possible. This is what's healthy. If you are sitting in a chair with both of your feet on the ground and your butt in the seat, you're giving yourself heart disease. You're fucking your body up. And you're contributing to the most likely killer. Sitting is very dangerous, and it should be taken much more seriously than it is taken today. I used to suffer a lot from headaches, and at first I found some comfort by learning how to properly hydrate myself and drink enough water, but I still found that when I would go on long bus rides or just sometimes I would just get so tense and get headaches, and I didn't really understand what was happening. And your muscles are basically made of a bunch of strings, right? And when you're sitting and hunching in the same areas, you cause these kind of knots to show up. You've probably heard of muscle knots, right? I had as well, I'd heard of massage, and enjoyed a massage before, but I didn't understand back then that muscle knots directly contribute to headache, because when you have a lot of tension in this area, your upper shoulders, your neck, the back of your head, this causes um, these knots to increase the pressure in the area, it gets inflamed. And this inflammation puts pressure on your nerves and pulls on your nerves, which causes you to have a headache. And this is so, in my case, it was so profoundly the cause of headaches that once I started paying attention to muscle tension and I realized that my headaches actually come from muscle pain. As I've gotten more into the habit of stretching, now I see why I was getting those headaches when I would be on a long bus ride. It was because I was hunched. I wasn't focusing on keeping my shoulders relaxed. I, I used to get really crippling headaches. And I understand now it wasn't genetic. That wasn't growing pains. And it also wasn't directly because of looking at a screen. What was happening is that I had had bad posture and I had been sitting in a way that induces tension in the shoulders. And that was causing me to be very prone to getting headaches. Anytime anything would make me tense up a little bit, I was already that close. I would get a bad headache. And now it barely even happens at all. And once I get headaches, I can actually massage and stretch my way out of the headaches, which is something I just thought was impossible before. So please pay attention to your body, your muscles, and particularly how you hold yourself, how you sit, and any... But honestly, one of the scariest things I've learned about in my whole life is carbohydrate. It's surrounding all of us. We're suffering so much because of our consumption of it. Our usage of it allows people to control us and hold food insecurity over us. We exist in a world that relies on it. But it makes you suffer. And I didn't know that either. I, I used to think, oh, I couldn't just eat a bunch of cheese all day because I'd get the runs, you know, I'd get stomach problems. I couldn't eat this, couldn't eat that, didn't enjoy that, didn't enjoy that, because it would give me stomach problems, right? And, you know, the reality is, it was always the carbs. 
grain and carbohydrate are useful for humans. Don't get me wrong. Many societies have been built entirely off of them, and the leverage that has been applied with grain against other countries and in war is pretty hardcore. But we don't actually need it. That's the problem. Carbohydrate and your consumption of it allows people to profit off of you. It makes you eat more. It's very innocent, like bread, pasta, this kind of stuff. It seems so innocent. It's traditional. It's part of culture in so many ways. How could it be bad? And in small amounts, yeah, it's not. But when you live off of carbohydrate, you deteriorate your life. There are things inside your arteries called mycocalyx. You know how I got nose with hair? Whoa, graphic, right? Same thing in your arteries. When you consume carbohydrate, these structures just dissolve. There's so many problems that carbohydrate causes that, yeah, they weren't a problem when people didn't even live to be 30. Yeah, it's awesome to have bread because then you can live to be 40 or 50. That's great. But in our modern society, where this is not the case, where you can expect to live longer, you have to be very careful with what you're sustaining yourself with. Because carbohydrate, and grain in particular, have complications. We die from heart disease. The US citizens die of heart disease. Nicaraguans die of heart disease. People in China, they die of heart disease. Everyone, everywhere, is dying of heart disease. Heart disease kills as many people as all the different forms of cancer combined. Or roughly equal on some years. Sometimes all the cancer together kills a little bit more than heart disease. But heart disease is a vicious killer. You should be scared of it. It is much more likely to kill you than any world war or anything else. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in most developed nations. And it comes from carbohydrate. That's the short truth. When you cut carbohydrate out of your life and your diet, and the only carbohydrate you consume is in small quantities bound within fiber of plants, vegetables, fruits, these things, that's how you step away from obesity. That's how you change your life, is getting the carbohydrate out of your life. But when you try and do that, you will see it is incredibly challenging because carbohydrate is all around us. It's in everything. And it's killing all of us. You've either been bothered that someone's looking at their screen when you want to talk to them, or someone's told you to get off your phone and look them in the eye. You've experienced one of those two situations, almost guaranteed. Screens are a huge part of our lives. The problem is our awareness of this. You know you look at a screen. We know we look at screens. We'll admit this. But unfortunately, we'll lie to ourselves about how much time we actually spend looking at your screen, at a screen. We're not even talking about laptops. I'm literally just talking about cell phones, okay? The average amount of time a person in the US spends per day with their phone screen on is over four hours. And you may think that's ridiculous. You may think, yeah, those people are just crazy. I'm not like that. You'd be surprised. We all underreport our own screen time. We all think that other people do it more, but we do it less. But when you actually track it yourself, you might be a bit disgusted. Screen time is taking over humanity. And if you're not careful, people are gonna profit off of gripping into your life and taking hours of every day of your life away and not giving you meaningful results back. We get abused, taken advantage of, and we end up depressed. Facebook, in particular, increases rates of depression. You use your screen a huge quantity of your day, and whether you want to admit it or not, there is a very high chance 
that you spend more time looking at your screen than into the eyes of the people you care about most. That is a great tragedy. Be careful with your screen and be aware of how much time you're spending on it. Let's talk about technology and screen time and crap. Cause I mean, come on, I'm, I'm a YouTuber. You're watching a YouTube video, right? Obviously, I love technology. And one thing that's quite ironic is a lot of people think that YouTube is for cat videos. And I see now adding this to the video in the course is kind of silly, because you watching this, obviously you realize that you can learn from YouTube. Can we learn from the, our neighbor's parrot? You can learn from YouTube, so you understand that, but most people don't. A lot of people really believe YouTube is for cat videos. YouTube is a waste of my time. We are so spoiled by our access to information that we have the balls to say that a powerful world of information at our fingertips is for cat videos. <laughs> you literally, the moment you watch a YouTube video for the first time that you could search for, you've opened the door to the answer to every single problem you ever experience in your entire life. All the information you need to make money, make friends, deal with trauma, figure your life out. It's all there. There is nothing stopping you aside from yourself and your belief that YouTube is for cat videos. Really? YouTube is so powerful. YouTube can educate people better than college because it's so fast. When I have children, I'm not sending them to college. I'm teaching them how to educate themselves using tools like YouTube. YouTube is one of the most powerful tools you have access to. Not only will it allow you to build money on something you care about, but it will connect you in a time where disconnection is all around us. YouTube and creating content on YouTube is so powerful. For me, I believe that my life changed totally. I stopped suffering so much. I stopped feeling so lonely. I stopped needing people to validate me or feel like, you know, I was like, you know what? Yeah, people talk shit, but people watch videos I made every day. No matter what I do when I'm sleeping, someone's watching a video about some shit I made four years ago. Like, it shows you that you are connected in a world of people who are also suffering and they need access to information and you can do something about it. You can make content that reaches these people. YouTube is so beautiful. Not only will it help you earn money, but when done right, it can teach you to live in a fulfilling way. You learn about things from YouTube, learn about them a lot, and make better content that teaches things even better than what you learned. You expand YouTube and you expand your awareness and yourself in the process. YouTube is beautiful. Now let's talk about genetics. <laughs> Another controversial topic. Uh, well, I'll just be straight up. Genetics, equally important as environment, you know? That's what they say. Maybe more important. You've heard about genetics and you've heard about nurturing or the environment, right? So there's your genetics, the color of your hair, and then there's the nurturing, which is like, did your mom spend time with you? Did your dad spend time with you? These kind of things. We're, we live in a world that acts like genetics are really important and they determine things. And you may even have been told, oh, you're depressed and maybe one of your family members is like, you know what, it runs in the family. It used to happen to me too. It's just how it is, it's all genetics. But you shouldn't focus on genetics because there is absolutely nothing you can do to change your genetics. If you're obese or you're suffering and you're saying it's your genetics, that is the same as saying, I have no choice. There is nothing I can do. You must focus on the things in life 
that you can do something about. No matter where you are, there are things that you can do to influence your environment and to start to shape yourself into more of the person you're destined to be. If you don't even think it's possible for you to overcome your problems and the way that you suffer because you think your genetics have sealed your fate, you're never even going to perceive it's possible to fix your problem. Genetics don't matter. Don't focus on the genetics. Focus on the environment. You are not your genetics. You are your environment, your habits, the people around you. This is who you are. Genetics were created by the environment. The birds and the flowers and all this, they're all genetically related to each other. But the environment is what creates the things that are able to live in it. Your environment is what created your genetics. The environment on Earth over millions of years is what created your genetics. So why do we act like our genetics are more important than our environment? That's just absurd. Your environment dictates almost everything. Your genetics are just good to know. If you're conscious, then technically you have energy to do things. I used to believe that my body was like a car. Like, I had gasoline in me, energy, and that enabled me to do stuff, go places. But if I didn't have energy, it's because there wasn't gas in my tank. I believed in spoon theory. I believed that there was a finite amount of it, and I just didn't have it in me. The unfortunate reality is I was living a life that was boring, wasteful, part of society in all the problematic, typical ways. I didn't feel like I had meaning. It was tragic. That's where my fatigue came from. Your mind is so powerful, it can make you blind when you can see. Never underestimate the power of the mind. You are your habits, your environment. This is what creates you. In reality, staying still will make you sleepy. Being in a bed or the place where you sleep, it will make you sleepy. Moving, going on a walk, these things will bring energy to you. It doesn't make sense. But that's because it's, like, it's our psyche. Our psyche is an illusion. Your body cannot actually know when you don't have energy. There is no way to feel whether you have energy or not. The only true way to know is to attempt the movement. And it will either work or your body will fail. That is the only true way to see if you do not have energy. Aside from that, you have energy. You've just been deprived. You've been raised in a time where you uh, were never taught to have what you need. You don't have what you need. You don't know how to live a meaningful life, how to be loved and nurtured. You didn't have the right influences on you, so you don't even know it's possible to care and want to be in this world. And as a result, you're fatigued. And I want to tell you that it's, it's not caused by your mind. I want to. But I've met people who have so much reason to be tired, and they're not. And I've met people who have so little reason to be tired, but they're so exhausted. And it's all about our minds. When you walk, you will feel better, you will feel more inspired, you will wake up. When you lay down, you will become sleepy. This is how it will work. The problem is not that you do not have enough energy. The problem is the circumstance that you've come into as a human in this society. You weren't given what you need, and therefore, you suffer, you struggle, and you don't understand why 
this is happening. Fatigue is an illusion. It doesn't mean you don't feel it, it doesn't mean it's not real, but it itself is an illusion. If you want to be less fatigued, you must do, you must walk, you must move. If you want to be more relaxed, you must sit still. Only then, with patience, you will get what you want. We, we all like to be instantly reachable, right? We think it's important, especially if you're a parent or, you know, you're in a relationship. You, you feel like you, you, you need to have your phone on you and be instantly reachable. Because if you're not, what if something goes wrong? What if something horrible happens and no one can get in touch with you? Unfortunately, being instantly reachable has a really negative effect on anxiety. You will be more anxious. You will be more frustrated. You will have a harder time in general in life if you're always instantly reachable. It is very bad for your mind, for your psyche, to be instantly communicatable by anyone in the whole world. And just because everyone around you accepts that and has a phone on them, and because people give you shit when you don't respond straight away, that doesn't mean that it's not going to affect you negatively. Being instantly reachable is really painful in the long run. And you need times where you are unplugged, where you are not instantly reachable. I understand feeling like you need to be there in an emergency. But you should understand that for most emergencies, you wouldn't be able to do anything anyway if you're relying on a phone to get there in time. You don't even, you're not near the person. What are you going to do? Call 911 for them? Show up? You know, it's too late at that point. That's part of life. Things can happen. Don't just forsake your mental health just in case something happens. Understand that having a phone on you all the time, being instantly reachable, comes at a cost to your mental health. This cost is unavoidable. Depression is a sign that something is missing from your life. If you're depressed, it's not because something is wrong with your brain. It's because there's some habit or some person who isn't there, and that's why you're depressed. You should not view your depression as something is wrong with you, and that's why you're depressed. Because that means you will never recover. It will create a mentality that will never heal. To create a healing mind, you must think that you can do something about it. You must believe it's possible to get better. So you must see your depression as a sign that something is missing. Depression is something I struggled with, whether you believe it or not. Even though you see me in all these videos and there's a lot of happiness and good energy and positivity, I've learned to be that way because I was forced to. My father died when I was a child. I was 11, 12, around this age. He was sick for almost two years. I saw my favorite person in the world who showed me what to love a child and to be there for them truly is. And I watched him die when I was a child. And that was tragic. And obviously, I dealt with depression as a result of that. There's no way not to. But the problem is our understanding of depression. Don't get me wrong, I went to plenty of people and they're like, oh, your dad's dead, you're depressed. Oh, diagnose, diagnose, boom, depression, diagnose, pills, depression, diagnose, dead, dead, diagnose, diagnose, depression. Oh, it was like clockwork for all them. They had it all figured out. They had this simple, clear path. Oh, yeah, your dad's dead, you're depressed. Take these pills, woo! I didn't want to. Because what I understand is that depression isn't something wrong with you. 
depression isn't something chemically imbalanced in your brain. Even though chemicals can be measured in your brain, a person going through depression is in a state of chemical imbalance. But to, to think that your brain is stuck that way, to think that there's just something wrong with you, you are depressed, fuck that. That is a waste of your life. And I let people tell me that shit. But it's not gonna help. You're never going to get better if you think that way. You will never become undepressed if you teach yourself, if you teach your mind that you are depressed because something is wrong with you. What I learned is that depression comes when something is missing from your life. So you cannot tell me <laughs> that you are depressed but nothing's missing as proof because for me, you are depressed because something is missing. And don't get me wrong, there's no way you could have known something was missing. There's no experience you had where you have everything you needed, all of the support, loving, encouraging, supportive people. You had romantic partners who loved you and nurtured you and were supportive. People don't have lives like that. We're not taught how to actually deal with life. We were built by systems put in place to produce factory workers. We were not produced by a system to educate humans on how to live proper lives and be humans. We are taught so many wrong things that are in the benefit of other people that we think that when we're depressed, it's because something's wrong with us. How on earth can you be happy if you haven't left everything behind? If you haven't been exposed to things that are different. If you haven't suffered. If you haven't had a meaningful life where you feel like people listen to you. And you can matter. You can do something and people want to hear what you say. People respect you. If you haven't felt that way. If you don't feel included. Why? Why would you be happy? You can have the best job in the world. You can be surrounded by money. You can get laid all the time. That isn't going to make you happy. You can have the best job in the world where everybody is jealous of the money and the cars and everything. You will still not be satisfied. You will not be happy. There's more to life than material and you need eye contact with other people. When you are depressed, it is your life's way of telling you something is missing. So figure out what is that thing that is missing from your life and then build a lifestyle where that is part of your life and then do that again and again and again and again and eventually you'll have an environment where you just don't feel depressed in. Because you've spent the time to build all the things that you need to be at your best. Another thing I used to believe is that reality, this, whatever this is, whatever you're experiencing right now, you know, reality, uh, used to think it was more important than my thoughts about reality. So I, I didn't really understand, like when I would get really anxious, I, I didn't get, I was like, why do I feel this way? There's nothing happening in my reality. But now I understand that your reality is actually less important than your thoughts. Because as far as we're concerned, our thoughts are our reality. And I know this seems silly to you, like, of course, but it's really important to recognize this because when you expose yourself to a lot of kind of intense things and a lot of negativity and a lot of critical people, this is going to have an effect on you. You know, it's, it's your mind is your reality. So you essentially bring everything you've experienced with you when you go someplace new. And this is a really important thing to understand because ultimately everything is an illusion 
because it is a thought, the only way that you can process the world is by creating an illusion of the world inside your own head that you update as you're living through it. Your thoughts affect the chemistry of your brain. They affect everything. So the thoughts that you're having are actually more important than your reality. The way you respond to an intense event in life is more important than the event itself. What happens to us doesn't matter. What matters is how we respond. Surely you've heard about meditation, right? We, we have all these bullshit things, all these weird definitions of meditation and all this crap. And it's so tragic because in this overstimulated, really distracted age, a human who doesn't meditate is screwed. Think of your mind as something that gets overwhelmed and will start to make mistakes and go like this, like, ah! You don't want that. <laughs> you want your mind to be able to move around peacefully, efficiently, and effectively, right? So in order to do that, you have to meditate. And I don't, I don't mean you have to meditate for hours, for days, or months, none of that shit. And you don't even need to like meditate in a specific way. You just have to understand that life stimulates you. Watching a movie, having a conversation, drinking things, smoking, anything you're interested in, learning anything stimulates you. This causes a stimulated state where your mind gets used to it and used to it and races and races and races and then eventually it starts being ineffective and you'll start to have anxiety and you'll, you'll make conclusions about your life and none of that's necessary because you can live in a state where you just see how to fix the problem. If you are emotional, it means you need to meditate, calm down, and see the solution. Solutions do not come out of intelligence. It is like water. When it is muddy, you sit still, and it becomes clear. This is the, true, the truth of all human problems. You must meditate. Otherwise, you are living in a weak state. You will make bad business decisions bad personal decisions, and you will react to things compulsively. You don't need to meditate all the time. You don't need to meditate at the same time every single day. You don't need to meditate for 30 or 40 minutes. You just need to understand that life stimulates you. This causes a state where you need to take a break. You can't just watch 20 videos in a row and think you're going to equally absorb all of them. Meditation between periods of arousal and intensity is very, very important. When you feel overwhelmed, meditate. You really need to develop this habit of meditating in reaction to things in life. Because if you don't, you're going to suffer a lot. I'm a very sensitive person and I, I can be insecure, very insecure. I've been trying to make this video, this course, I finished this, right? This whole layout of everything and all the research and practiced everything and knew everything. And I've been trying to make this course for three months because sometimes when I try and record, I feel so insecure about myself that I don't even think it's worth it. Yet here I am talking to you. Is this weird to you? You too probably live under the illusion that you're the one who's insecure. Not other people, not other YouTubers, not someone like me who's put out a bunch of content showing my face online. But I am, I'm insecure just like everyone else. And this is a lesson for you. Because if you think that you're the only one who's insecure, You'll eventually come to identify yourself as insecure. You'll believe your insecurity is part of yourself. But it is not. Insecurity is a shackle given to us by society to stop us from doing what we love. 
We all have this shackle. And maybe if you see that, if you can really realize that all the people around you, even the ones who you think are really confident, really cheerful, really happy, all of these people have struggled with insecurity. I've met people that I perceived there's nothing they have to be insecure about, yet seen them make cripplingly insecure decisions. We are all insecure. Don't trick yourself into thinking otherwise. You are no more or less insecure than others. It's all about the habits and how you identify yourself with. Are you going to get into the habit of identifying yourself as an insecure person? Well, then you'll be more insecure. But understand that that's a habit. It's not a character trait. We all can learn confidence. It's a habit. Insecurity is a habit. And trust me, you can overcome it. <laughs> because I always do. I feel insecure every time I make a video. And then eventually, I don't feel insecure anymore. And I have fun. But if I wasn't even willing to just say fuck it and do it anyway, I wouldn't have this channel. I wouldn't be here, right? These 20 things really have helped me live a much more meaningful, happy life where I spend money on things that are worth it, that bring good into my life. And I'm able to not be in pain because of digestion. I have enough energy to do anything I want. I don't feel like I need more energy. I don't feel like there's some problem holding me back. I see how I can do anything because I can create the environment that creates what I want. So there isn't anything I can do, just like you, just like anyone else. We stop ourselves. We hold ourselves back, okay? Thanks for watching. And again, if you're interested in consulting with me, I do consultations. It's $20 per 30 minutes. There's a wide variety of different things. I personally prefer it if you have a problem you want solved and you bring that problem to me. If you want to learn how to do something, try some new software, I can guide you through it, okay? Let me know. You can reach me by going into the top link in the description or by going to calendly.com slash Jack Dermot Pittman. This will allow you to book a call with me. You just put it straight into the calendar. No need to do any messaging. It's all automated. And like I said, it's $20 per 30 minute session. Tell me what you want to learn about and I'll do everything in my power to make you leave that call better off than you were in the beginning. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.